Hello! In this video, we're going to talk about the logic of contrast coding, categorical variables, and regression. So you've probably already looked at the dummy coding. This is contrast coding. I think it's particularly nice, and I, I probably use this a lot more than dummy coding. I like it because in contrast, um, to dummy coding, it sets up a direct comparison. And you can compare combined means instead of just a single, really pairwise mean. Um, it's also nice in that um, when the sample sizes are equal, they're orthogonal. So you're extracting independent information, which is fantastic. Um, and you know sometimes there's just not something that's reasonable to be a control group, or you want to do something a little more sophisticated. So this is directly um, like your ANOVA when you did orthogonal polynomials. These are one and the same. So these are exactly the same as contrast coding um, that you may have done in a priori comparisons in ANOVA or post hoc comparisons. So same data set. Um, after this video, then we'll do, show you how to do these in SPSS. Again, it's exactly the same as before. So we still have did not drink in the past 30 days, uh, bought, took, or stole, and given alcohol. The data are the data. Now, in contrast coding, let me scoosh this down a little bit. In contrast coding, the idea is, is to make a comparison that's interesting. And then if you want to construct an orthogonal set, meaning an independent set, there are a couple little rules you follow. So perhaps the best way to look at this would be to say, well, you know, just looking at these variables, there's lots of different ways you could do this, but what might be what might be interesting to compare? Well, what jumps out to me is I might want to know if I could predict um, mean differences between the group that didn't drink and the group that bought, took, stole, and was given alcohol behind and you uh, combine. And you can think of um, let's predict number of uh, number of drinks or the number of times they drank um, and look at that. So I think you know the did not drink versus the bought, took, stole, and given alcohol combined might might be helpful. You know, again, this isn't great science in terms of uh, substance use and abuse because we would hope there would be a difference with that. The idea then is is to create these comparisons and they follow directly from the null hypothesis. So we could rewrite this to say mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 plus mu sub 3 divided by 2 equals 0. So we're saying that the, this mean um, minus these combined means equals 0. Well, it's not, you know, if you look at it, you could say, well, there's probably, a, there, you could think of an implied one here and a half and a half. And indeed, I don't particularly like working with fractions, so I could put in the same thing. I could put two for comparison one, minus one, and minus one. That's exactly the same as this null hypothesis. So my, my grandma terms here are, can I predict number of drinks um, a child has between those who did not drink versus if they got alcohol somehow? You really kind of think of this as kind of a baseline control um, idea because obviously we should hope this should be significant. This then brings in one of the rules for constructing these orthogonal coefficients. It's the sum of the coefficients needs to equal zero. So well, we could just add it up. We could say equals the sum and just add these up like we've done before. Kind of overkill in, in Excel. You can kind of see it's zero. Oops. <laughs> uh, oh well, no biggie. Let's just add it up. Um, two um, plus minus one plus minus one equals zero. Um, how quirky. It didn't work before. So we're good. We're absolutely good. Now the key is, and this is a simple example because we have just three levels. We could do comparison two, and the idea is, is it should be orthogonal. It should be independent from comparison one. So if you look at it, 
after we test comparison one, or our new variable one, this will be x1. Let me just put that in here now. This is x1. Oops, not triple x. Um, x2. After we do that, and you know me, I like to sort of organize things as we go. Um, we'll be able to tell something about how many drinks someone, a, a kid has had between if they didn't drink at all and if they bought, stole, or were given alcohol. So if someone says, great, tell me, is there a difference in number of drinks between those who got it and those who were given it? You go, well, I don't know. I just did this comparison, did not drink versus got somehow. We don't know anything about these two that were combined. So it might be nice to compare them. So we don't ever need to compare this again. We've been there, done that. But now it might be nice to say, well, is there a difference in number of drinks between those who bought, stole, and took alcohol versus those who were given alcohol? So we could code that one, code it minus one. And again, we could, I'm not gonna do that sum. It should work, I just did something silly. Plus this, and this shows you another way um, to add up things. And it sums to zero, so we're good, absolutely good. The second condition is this second rule to construct orthogonal polynomials is that the sum of the c i c j equals zero so this means the sum of the cross products all pairwise we only have three levels so we only have one you know cross product but if you had three levels or three comparisons so you had four levels you'd have more so we could just do this we could say um two times, I mean, this is really silly. I mean, this is so simple, um, but I think it's good to see it slowly. Minus one times one. And finally, now you're yawning into your computers. That's okay. Feel a little bit smug. You're getting this. Um, zero minus one, one, clearly that sums to zero. So these are orthogonal. Um, and you've demonstrated it mathematically, but more than that, I think you can see it logically that um, this comparison, we're doing do not drink versus these two combined. The second comparison, well, we ignore this because we already have a little information there. And instead, we're doing um, bought, stolen, took versus given. When we plug these into the regression line, our y predicted, um, beta 1, beta x, um, plus, whoops, a public typing is the worst. Then, let me just make this so we're consistent. Put on the symbol font. You'll be pros in, if you're not already, in Excel by the time we get done with class. So take a look at this. And again, let me increase the font here. I don't want you to have to, whoops, ew, yeah, that's huge. Look at that big um, alpha. So we've got, we're predicting, um, we're predicting um, a mean difference here. Um, so, or a mean actually like we're predicting. So we have the intercept, which doesn't have that nice interpretation it did before. It's a form of the grand mean. And then each of these new slopes now tests the comparison. So if you think back to ANOVA, then what you have is you've got your built-in comparisons. So if we test this together, we get the omnibus test of this variable. And if we test, we look at the individual slopes, then we get the individual tests, which is fantastic. We get the comparisons. So from an ANOVA point of view, it's like a twofer. And I just think it sets up much easier. Uh, through regression. So with that, uh, we'll pause and then we'll have some videos coming up that show you how to code in, in um, SPSS and how to run the analysis so you have some more to practice on. In the meantime, make sure you write this out and so that you can have it next to you when we go to the videos on, on coding 
in SPSS. So as always, keep me posted on what's working for you in these and what isn't working for you in these. And another one's coming up.